Oh, oh, is it? Wait, is the thing not working? Oh, there it is. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Hello, Void Dweller Doors. Welcome back to The Legend of Heroes Trails from Zeros. Sorry about uh, the delay in the streams. I was sick and still kind of am, but I'm feeling better enough that uh, I can do a stream today. Hopefully by the next Chaos Child stream on Tuesday, I'll be 100%, but feeling good enough for this anyway. Uh, enough of that. Last time, we, SSS went all around Crossbell searching for clues about the mafia of mysterious drugs. And it looks like they might be like demonically enhanced drugs. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Holy shit. I wonder where, like, uh, like, so that's how that whole plot of the, you know, the temple having like the newly activated demon portal thing ties into this. Huh. So it feels like the mafia almost might be like. A secondary like opponent. Hello, nicey. Hello, boy traveler. Welcome to the stream. And uh, whoever is like this mysterious drug lord that is selling them the drugs might actually be the true final boss of this game, at least. But anyway, we first have an end of day cutscene to do, and then we can finally, finally do finish Pack Alley Dr. Glenn. Yep. Yeah, it was pretty bad, but I managed to pull through. My whole family got it, but we're doing better. Well, it's almost getting, it's already getting pretty late. So we better grab bus instead of walking back. No argument here. Thank goodness for this bus system of ours. I don't know what we do without it. We get a car, you know, with your oodles of cash. Oh yeah. What is up with Tio? Tio. Tio? Nanda, Tiosuke. Saki kara miyo ni shizuka dana. What's the matter, Tio? Dad, been awfully quiet for a bit now. Tio, so na koto. Uh, I am. Fine. What's going on? Tio-chan! Tio! Oh, she's... Oh, wow. Is she sick? The sun makes it hard to see, but your face... It's so pale! What? Oh, God! I told you. Remember? Our motto. I'm fine. I just feel a bit unwell is all. Uh, no. Feeling unwell means you're not fine. We're at the hospital right here. We should get her checked out. Like, we're literally right here. There's gonna be some place to rest around. Oh. Oh shit, is she gonna faint? Uh, Tio! Tio! Oh no! I'll go get a doctor. Hurry! Oh god. Wow. I was not expecting this. This is morbidly appropriate. Oh, okay. Whew. It was just her anemia acting up, thank goodness. After a bit of rest, she should wake up and be good as new. That's good news, at least. What a relief. <sighs> you said it. For a second there, I was getting pretty worried. Stay 
Bastille. I'm sorry we couldn't put her in a normal hospital bed. Mine was the only one available. Unfortunately, every room we have in the hospital is occupied right now. That's all right. I'm sure your room will be more than enough to help Tio recover. Cecile, thank you so very much. <laughs> Don't mention it, Ellie. I have to work the night shift tonight. So it's perfectly fine if she wants to rest here until tomorrow morning. Now, I didn't have to deal with fainting. I was just very, very tired. And, uh, you know, aches and pains everywhere and headaches. Well, I'll be going then. Thanks. Oh. That was an odd delay. Thanks, Cecile. We really appreciate the help. Tio, only we'd notice sooner. Not that I think about it. She first started to look a little sick during a conversation with Dr. Gunter. And if I remember correctly, it was when he started telling us about that drug those devil worshippers made. I'm fine, you know. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Tio! Tio! You're awake! I'm so glad. <laughs> You had us worried, you know. Without the jacket. Please. There was no need to be. Given that you're involved in the ongoing drug investigation, I know it's your duty to ask me. Why would she know anything? About everything I know, I mean. Listen, Tio. Yeah, it does look like a very sci-fi outfit, for sure. Do you really think we would push you to share something you're clearly uncomfortable about talking about? Hello, Antonio. Welcome to the stream. Huh? Well, the investigation is definitely important. These are two separate matters. You're more to us than just a colleague. Above all, you're an irreplaceable friend, Tio. Everyone's got some bits of their past they'd rather not talk about. Yeah, definitely, he's the one to say that for sure. Well, I guess mine can end up getting out anyway. Thanks a lot, Garcia. But if you didn't really don't want to talk about what you know, Tiotan, then we'll do everything we can to support that decision. Randy! That's how we all feel, Tio. 
もしが俺たちに話したいんだったら。Probably not void unless it was like a big poofy dress. If you ever decide you want to tell us about the things you've kept hidden, talking about them with us will help ease your burden, even a little. Then know that all of us would be happy to help shoulder it for you. Lloyd. I'm constantly amazed by the embarrassing things you say when you get into one of your speeches. Not just you, Fat Ellie and Randy, too. <laughs> the Lord's cheesiness must be rubbing off on you. So, come on now. Yeah, I think he got us there. Clearly, we've been spending too much time listening to Lloyd. Yeah, yeah, laugh it up. Barrier. Where? Oh. Oh, wow. So this has to do with her past? Oh, jeez. I've already told Lloyd a part of this story. But let me explain from the start. Oh, wow. She's a lot like Ren. And this. Oh, my God. When I was five years old, I was kidnapped. That's right, and Guy saved her. That's right, that's right. And held captive by a cult of religious fanatics. <laughs> no! Damn! Shit, what the hell? The cult's objective in doing so is still unknown. But one thing is clear. They were attempting to obtain something by rejecting the goddess and worshipping devils. I think that they saw me and the other captive children as offerings. Nothing more, nothing less. Simply a means to obtain whatever they wanted. Kumotsu? Offerings? Hello, Roxas. is welcome to the stream. Yeah, I was wondering. It sounded like they would be sacrificed. Yes, I call them offerings because sacrifices wouldn't exactly be right. Though, I suppose it's possible the term could apply to some of the children. The cult had several lodges, and each was experimenting with different rituals. As for the lodge I was taken to, their rituals primarily involved various, various kinds of human experimentation. Human experimentation? Oh my god. What did they do? So is that why you got those enhanced senses of yours? Hi. Precisely. Oh my god. 
sensors were attached to our entire bodies, and we were pumped full of drugs. They attempted to enhance our five senses, using any method imaginable. They even tried enhancing our sensitivity to supernatural phenomena by applying psychological stress and hypnosis. For three long years, that was my life, day in, day out. Holy shit! What the fuck? So, so na... That can't be. So I don't know if I was like this. Despite all that, I was one of the lucky ones. None of the children could withstand the procedures. Except for me. One by one, they began to disappear. And it was at that moment, when I became the last child remaining, that I gained this power. Jeez. My hearing became keen enough that even though a massive rock wall separated us, I could hear the others' final cries as though I was right there in the room with them. <laughs> <sighs> Those monsters. Then something happened. Lloyd's brother, Guy, broke into the lodge. The team accompanying Guy was able to neutralize the cult followers and dismantle the lodge's operation. The resistance was strong, but the moment the lodge fell, most of the cultists commits, committed suicide. Guy passed by countless bodies littering the ground until he finally reached the ceremonial chamber. She is the only one that survived. Oh, my God. So what we're thinking here is that one of them m might have escaped. One of the cultists might have escaped. And is starting this whole thing. And there he found me. The only surviving child. Guy-san,你保護された時、私は衰弱しきっていました。<laughs> By the time Guy found me, I was wasting away. So weak, I was near death myself. I was quickly brought to this hospital and spent several months recuperating here. What happened after that, I've already told Lloyd about. So that's what really happened. Tio chan. Tio, I. And in a cruel twist of fate, 
あれだけお世話になって感謝していた人だったのに How I was so grateful to God for saving me from that place 三年前ガイさんが亡くなったことを聞かされた時私はあまり悲しくなかったんです When I heard that he passed away three years ago I didn't feel much of anything まるで手に入れた力と引き換えに人間らしい感情を失ったような Oh God <sighs> It's as if in exchange for this power I had my emotions stripped away そんな不思議な考えすらありました That's how it felt to me at least Tio Tio Oh, oh Randy is Wow, Randy is being so empathetic here. <sighs> right, emotional detachment as a coping mechanism to survive, yeah. Is But I think back then I actually wanted to ask him something. I wanted to ask a strong and possibly optimistic person like Guy. <laughs> How exactly should a broken person like me live? でも結局その答えは聞けずエプスタイン財団に引き取られて。Sorry. In the end, though, I missed my chance to ask, and I ended up being recruited by the Epstein Foundation. Hello, children. Welcome to the stream. So, she and Kanikite Mina Santo is so near us day. After that, I joined the special support section and began to live with all of you. Yapari, Mother Monoko, a caranais. But even now, I still haven't figured out the answer. How should I live my life? God. And why? Why did I survive? Why am I here? Tio chan. Tio! You better. Oh, yeah. Huh. You don't have to worry about that. It's okay not to know the answers. Everyone struggles with those very same questions. Huh? <laughs> Sorry. Why are we here? How should we live our lives? I'm so glad she hugs her. Come on, group hug with everybody. Please. There aren't many people out there who do have answers to those questions, Tio. Me, Ellie, Randy, we're all lost, same as you. <laughs> I know I definitely lost my way for a bit, that's for sure. 
Seriously, they are such a family. I can't imagine them ever parting ways. They have to all live together forever. And that includes Kia. Archie. <laughs> Sorry. Still, tear up. There's no need to rush to find answers to those questions. <laughs> Sorry. We're gonna our entire lives to figure stuff like that out. If you can't help but wonder what the answers are, all you need to do is keep searching for them. Well, the thing is, you know how it's believable that they became so close so quickly? It's because there were a lot of time skips. Like, we had a lot of time skips of several weeks or months. So, it, it's in, in actuality, it's not that short of a time. As well. Like, it's really believable that way, too. And remember, you don't have to do it alone. We can search for the answers together. Of course, that includes me. Yeah. Randy, the chief, Kia, and even Zai. We're all here for you. <laughs> they can never not live together ever, ever, ever. I uh, they they all are except for Tio, I think, boy. <sighs> Although Hello Mirage welcome to the stream. I'll help you find the answers you're looking for. Oh! <laughs> I knew it. Lord really has rubbed off on you too. <laughs> You're all making such cheesy speeches now. <laughs> Why are you like this? Ma, それも巡り合わせだろう。Well, we didn't really have a say in the matter, you know. The moment we joined the SSS, we were faced to fall, fated to fall victim to Lord Sappiness. Ha! I'm Randy Orlando, and I'm fine. Randy's right. We're a team. We share what we feel, even if it is embarrassing. I don't really get why this is my fault, but... Lloyd, it's a compliment. They're complimenting you, Lloyd. I definitely agree with Ellie's last point. <laughs> we share everything. Embarrassment, our past pains. And of course, her smiles and happiness as well. That's what it means to be a team, right? Okay. <laughs> oh. Please stop. 
たたまれないのに No, they are more than a team. They are, they are a family. They can never not be together, ever. Never, never, ever. <laughs> All your sappy feelings are smothering me. I don't know how much more I can take. <laughs> But for some reason, it's not a bad feeling. Oh my god! After, after their heartfelt talk, the SSS took the bu bus back to Crossbell City. When they returned to the SSS building and put an exhaustive to you in bed, Lord, Ellie, and Randy decided to have one more talk with Chief Sergei. Oh my god. Okay, so Kia wasn't like sapping energy from Tio for. Okay, so I'm just glad about that. So, so no name I got did it. Hello, Kuros. Welcome to the stream. No, they are a family. They are like, and this is not even the end of the first game. Seriously. Uh, they could never not live together ever, ever, ever. It would be way too sad if they ever, like, stopped being together. <laughs> Hello, Callus on Twitch. Welcome to the stream. Sorry. I didn't say it before. <sighs> Exactly, that's why I really prefer a smaller cast in an RPG. Because everyone gets so much more time. Like, I love it. Jeez. Damn it. That name again. Gnosis. Gnosis. Why are they all pronouncing the G? Gotcha. <coughs> Chief, it's about time you tell us. Ooh. Please. That's what I thought, Antonio. Please, tell us what my brother was involved in six years ago, and about the cult that kidnapped Tio. Please, you must be aware of everything that happened. I had a feeling you knew it was up with Tio Todd from the start. I know it was true. Of course, I knew about the cult. Tuji Gaito Tumuni, Kyodan no Roji no Hitosu, say at Sushita Tujisha da Tagarana. Back when they were at the height of their power, it was Guy and I who tracked down and took out one of their lodges. One of. So, so that Tandiska. You did? Soreja Kajoa Anikino. The chief. You were my brother's. Success no Joshi datta. Ah! Oh wow! Oh, he must have felt responsible for Lloyd. Oh my God! Oh, he really is the the, the grandpa of, of the group. Oh. Oh. Yes, I was guy's superior officer. I guess even back then I was a bit of an oddball in the force. So one day I ended up with two un unconventional rookies assigned to serve under me. Two. 
Who's the other one? One of them being your brother. Was the other one the detective? The first division detective, I mean. Girl was impulsive, a bit reckless too, but he was a damn great detective. In <laughs> The other rookie was like night and day in terms of personality. Two of them made a hell of a team, like a freaking body cop comedy. What exactly was this other rookie? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's Dudley. That, yeah. It's gotta be him, right? It's like a freaking. They were like buddy cops. Don't tell me it was that Dudley guy from the first division. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Wow, I really thought it was him. No, Dudley was hired straight into the first. That guy was practically born for that division. As for this other rookie, I bet you've heard of him somewhere before. What? thought that oh wow I guess he became a bracer because he was disillusioned with all the corruption oh my god and like with guy dying and all too like that was the that must have been the last straw for him his name is Arius McLean <laughs> What? He was a part of the police? He was. But he traded his police badge in for the Bracer's Gauntlet some years back. Hell, that's probably one of the reasons the police here in Crossfell have such a rocky relationship with the guild. Nantoma. Didn't see that coming. So my brother and Arios both joined the force at the same time. Yes, though Arios was a couple of years older than Guy. Oh, wow. Yeah, they had a whole Naruto and Sasuke thing going on here, I see. And it showed. Arius was always a bit more mature. He was already a family man with a wife and daughter at the time. Really? Okay, so she was already born. Okay, so yeah, it wasn't Dudley, but it was someone with a similar attitude. Oh my god, yeah, they're, they're the buddy cops, yeah. Exactly, Cassius. Like, when uh, General Morgan distrusted Bracers, yeah. Welcome to the stream, by the way. Guy, on the other hand, he was as bright-eyed as he was foolish. A wild card who was always rushing off to help people. I think there are many differences where the reason they got along so well. 
クロスベル警察最強の若手コンビと言われるようになった A little less than two years after joining the force and those two were already being heralded as the CPD's rising stars Considering what we know about their skills, I can definitely believe that. Exactly. To be honest, I was damn proud of those boys. So, after all, not many people get the chance to mentor two fine young rookies like them. You still don't know how he died. Our squad was able to accomplish a lot in the time we had together. I hope they weren't like set up to fall. With this. To the point where the higher ups decided to leave the joint investigation of a certain international case to us rather than the first division. Oh, are they talking about the cult? Joint investigation? International case? Wait, are you talking about? Yes, it was about the cult. DG Kyodan. DG. DG, that's their official name. Written out with the therefore sign in the middle. DG Kyodan. D therefore G. So no ten 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 one no no. I was gonna say that, Randy. X a therefore sign. So they were. Three dots arranged in a triangle. It's a symbol used in mathematical proofs and logical arguments. D, U, N, G, to you know, Nani, you mean, Steren, the show. I'm guessing devils and goddess? But what exactly do the T and G stand for? You mother, Sriva, for me, Danga, so no, you know, G, you can't stay, none to get to me, right? We never solved the entire riddle, but we did uncover what the meaning of the G is. G. Oh, no, Gnosis. It stands for Gnosis. That's right, Gnosis. That's the, that is the pronunciation. Yoahim <laughs> Sensei, <laughs> So yeah, they're back. One of them, at least one of them, clearly must have survived. So it it feels like devils bring for bring forth knowledge, is what it means. Because gnosis means knowledge. So. The drug Doctor Gunter told us about, the one rumored to use power barred from devils. So it's not on the kayo. This can't be a coincidence. Jigen Gashu gets a state of playing a body. It's already been six years since that whole mess. Oh, Kuno Nazo no Costa Shukyo Dante Danga. Stutz Tashkani Yeruko Tungari. Those zealots left behind a lot of mysteries. But I know of one thing for sure. Sureva Koko Sujun and the. Out of my decades of service on the force, this group were the most disgusting pieces of shit I've ever had the displeasure to encounter. Whoa. <coughs> the bastards used the kids they kidnapped as sacrifices at their lodges. <sighs> so then, the abduction case Mr. Grimwood, Grimwood mentioned yesterday, it was... Oh wow, that is terrifying. 
The GG Cult. That is a horrifying symbol. They had more than 10 active lodges spread across all Zemuria. And they performed various rituals in each of them. Oh. Oh, shit. Hey, can we tell Sergey about what we found, like, literally the other day? Summoning horrific devils, taking advantage of artifacts from them for their gain. Experimenting on those poor children. And there was always one constant in their rituals. <coughs> so their drug is called Gnosis. A mysterious drug called Gnosis. <sighs> this is all a lot to take in. So the so, how'd you end up solving a case as messed up as this one? Uh. Oh, right. Is that Cassius Bright? And is that Zin there too? Is that Zin? That's Cassius! Well, it's about time I get my place in this game already. Like I said yesterday, this issue affected a number of countries, so this got together and organized a joint investigation. I wonder, is this connected to Ren's situation in any way? Each country's army, police force, and bracer good branches collaborate. Under the command of a certain famous bracer. <laughs> That's me! Ready to fight, evil cults. We launched a large-scale operation to round up and suppress every last one of the cult's lodges. Is that you? As for my soul, small squad of three, we are in charge of taking down a lodge located on the outskirts of Altair. Located in Western Kelp. Oh my god. It was there that Guy rescued Tio Plot, who was eight years old at the time. Tio was a mason and barely responsive. And she was one of the lucky ones. After all, none of the other kids made it out alive. And even though what Tio had to go through was monstrous, there were even more horrific things happening to the kids at the other lodges. And... Why? Why? Why are people like this allowed to exist? I... I feel like I'm gonna be sick. Compared to the criminals we've dealt with here in Crossbell, these guys are completely on a completely different level of twist. No. Yes. 
6年前のその作戦をもって教団は完全に叩き潰された。Was DG involved with Ren's situation too? Like, did, were, did they kidnap her as well? Because it seems like even Ouroboros helped taking, taking down this situation. At any rate, and after the operation six years ago, the cult was completely wiped off the map. 信者たちは全員自決するか、精神に破綻をきたして、衰弱死した。All of its zealots either committed suicide or suffered a psychotic breakdown and wasted away. 残党もいたって話だが、教会や例の結社とやらが動いて、密かに殲滅したっていう噂もある。Yes, I do remember a certain encounter Kevin had in Gehenna. He, Kevin helped take down these cults. I remember that. Kevin was helping with this as well, definitely. Some have speculated that there were a few survivors, but rumor has it that the church and the society exterminated the rest of them. Yeah, like even Ouroboros hates these guys. DG Kyodan no Akumu wa kanzen ni owatta hazu datta. The nightmare known as the DG cult should have finally been over. This guy. But, but now, these blue pills have appeared. Korega sono kyodan ni atska te ita. Gnosis de ar kanose ga dete kita to yu wake desne. There's a chance these pills are the gnosis the cult used in the rituals. Gen jiten de wa oksoku no hai ni na. Right now, that's just speculation on my part. If it's true, six years ago, the cult was killed in a different way. But if this is the real deal, I'm afraid the nightmare of six years ago might have resurfaced in another form. That's why the mafia is trying to get involved in this way. The mafia even getting involved with scum of the earth like this. My god. Wow, Reveche. You have no standards. Fucking hell. Hell, jeez. One that will entangle itself with this conflict between these two mafias. Sounds like, sounds like things couldn't get any worse. But if all this is true, we have to do something! Uh, I couldn't agree more. I wonder if this DG survivor is the one that killed a guy. We have no idea how God died yet, and it's pissing me off. Oh my god, are you gonna tell us? What the fuck happened? Is he a member of this cult? The one who killed your brother three years ago is still at large. Hi. I know. Okay, so they have no idea. No leads were found and the case eventually went cold. Yes, there weren't any witnesses either. If the guy transferred to the first, he'd only ever take on cases by himself. I imagine we might find out either at the end of this game and they're going to be like the final boss for next game or, or, we'll, or we'll find out in the next game. There's no way we'll never find out. That's like too good of an opportunity for like an ultimate boss.
ルバージェそれともラブシェイの犯罪組織。No, I don't think anyone from r a v i s h e could take down Guy. It would have to be someone super strong. It's been speculated that the culprit was an intelligence agent from Aravonia or Kelp. Maybe a member of Ravish. Moshkova, Dogozona Gyoke than ya, Terrorist son and Tenomo Kamaerator. Well, some have tossed around the idea of a Jaeger Corps or terrorist cell being responsible. Daga, so they ain't any more than Otomo Kasimita Kamo Sega. Oh, really? He has a theory. It just seemed that he has a cigarette on his character model, but not in his profile picture. I just noticed that. However, there's always been another possible culprit in my mind. The DG survivor, I bet. Yeah. Remnant of the cult, right? Yes, I'd say that possibility is even more likely now. So, no, you mean, for me, this whole thing is starting to look more and more like a chance to avenge my fallen subordinate. For me, this whole thing is starting to look more and more like a chance to avenge my fallen subordinate. Are you going to join the party? So sorry for myself, but I'm going to be butting in from now on. Chief! There's no need to apologize. We'd love your help. You're trying to tell me you didn't butt in before now? <laughs> <laughs> Who can say? <laughs> But anyway, I figure it's about time I told you. I might have founded this special support section. But the one who first came up with the idea was Guy. What? This was Guy's idea? But what about the SSS being created to oppose the guild's popularity? That was just something I fed the top brass to get them to agree to. While he was still alive, the guy told me something I'll never forget. He said that what Crossbell needs is the strength to overcome its barriers. Oh, we're with our combo attacks! A place where young people can make mistakes, learn, grow, and combine their strengths into one. He told me he thought that was exactly what the police force need. Aniki. Guy. Damn, that brother of yours sure was something, Lloyd. So, was that the reason Tio joined the SSS too? Uh uh. So far, we need more. Randy is the, is the one like with the least amount of backstory explored. I'm betting his will take a lot of the, the next game. Could be. I'm willing to bet she wanted more than any to be a part of a group that carried on Guy's will. <laughs> Not that she'd ever said as much to me. Wow. I had no idea. <sighs> well, setting aside Guy for now. I think our most urgent priority is stopping the damage these drugs are causing. 
and regarding Kia, can she please live with us? I think it's possible that what happened to her is related to the cult somehow, too. Oh shit! Then maybe we shouldn't get back her memories if she was, like, traumatized and, like, forgot them, her memories as, like, a coping mechanism. This is me up to think about it, but it does seem like. For all that talk about drugs being the cause of her amnesia. Yes, unfortunately, I'm beginning to think that as well. So, Chief? Can you leave the investigation to us? What will you protect Kia here? Wow, this is a long cut scene. Because we have to coordinate with the first division. We'll need someone to stay behind and give us orders while we're in the field. Oh. That's true. Yeah, with the way this case is shaping up, we're really gonna need someone calling the shots from back at base. I'm sorry, Chief. I know you went out of your way to offer your help. This is the key to our success. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay, fine. But listen up, just like before, I won't be giving you guys any direct instructions. You can have all the advice you want. I'll even take care of combs for but you're going to make your own decisions and solve the case with your own will. So, are you up to the challenge? Hi. Yes, sir! Understood! Sounds like we're gonna have our work cut out for us during the morning. Heading into the end game. So I wonder what's going gonna go on with the mafia. The mafia seem to be like a red herring now for these guys. Seem like a true boss. The next day, 8 a.m. Like we have the whole, we still have the whole mafia plot going plot going on. Tio, Hontoni Daijobka. Are you sure you're okay, Tio? You can always wait here with the chief and Kia if you don't feel well enough to go. There is no need to worry. It is the title theme. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the stream. Well, I, I'll, I'm just going to get the the last back, the back alley Dr. Glenn, and then read it for the rest of the stream. That is all I'm gonna do. Uh, for the rest of the stream, but yeah. And then next time we'll do those side quests. I think it's the last set of side quests, maybe? I was able to get quite a bit of rest, so I'm feeling much better than usual, actually. Well, you do look a lot better than you did yesterday, that's for sure. Did she heal her? Still, I was pretty surprised when, when Kia told me she wanted to sleep next to you last night. Hmm. I just feel like he mooded you all of a sudden. Was she helping her? Did she heal her? 
Did she know? Did she sleep good? Eh, so they were much wrong. Of course. Yeah, I think she might have healed her. I can only imagine the reason I'm in such pristine condition. Because I spent so much time with you, Kia. Mana is fully recharged. <laughs> you got that? Yay! Not a good Sorry. You're a lifesaver, Kido. <laughs> Indeed. It's as if she's our very own special pick me up. Oh, that reminds me. What are you going to promise me this one thing to you? Huh? If something like yesterday happens again. Please tell us about it. Don't bottle it up. It'll only make it that much harder on yourself. I don't mean to be harsh, but if you were to collapse in the middle of a fight, we'd all be in trouble. Roger. I will keep that in mind. I'm a member of the special support section. I intend to stand on equal footing with the rest of you. Thank you. I'm lucky to have people like you who I can share my pain and burdens with. ハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハハ
Lloyd Banning, special support section. Uh oh. Is he turning into a monster? Lloyd, it's me, Bixen. Oh, hello, sir. It's good timing, actually. How's Gantz been holding up? Yes, about that. Oh, shit. He, um, seems to have disappeared again. What? Can you fill us in on the details? Oh, shit. Of course, you see, Gantz finally woke up late last night, but... He kept fading in and out of consciousness, so we decided to let him continue to sleep for the time being. Just to be safe, I stayed with him overnight, thinking I'd report back to you today. But when I woke in the morning, Gantz was nowhere to be found. I see. Have you called the hotel or the casino? Yes, but I was told that no one has seen him for quite some time. Lloyd, what should we do? For now, I think it would be best if you stay at the hotel, sir. It's possible that Gantz might come back. We're already going out to gather some information, so we'll make sure to keep an eye out for it. Something comes up, please don't hesitate to give us another call. Alright, thank you. Did I hear that right? Gantz disappeared again? Yeah, apparently snuck out of the hotel this morning. Is that her by his own accord or? This is all the more reason to check on the other individuals who have used this drug as well. Ah. Man, I got a bad feeling about this. This situation might be escalating faster than we anticipate. Don't worry about things here. Just go and see what you can find. Hi. Yes, sir. Have a good day. <laughs> oh my god, we have control. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, I, um, I just have to take a, a quick, a quick break. I will be right back. Okay, you guys, I just need to check on something really quick. I will be right back.
All right, we're back. Uh, everything's okay now. Let's go get that back alley, Dr. Glenn. Believe it or not, we have to freaking uh, go into the goddamn casino. How, how did I miss the casino? All right. Getting that freaking book. Buy five Mishy plushies and exchange them at the Nine Poly Exchange. Oh my god. Uh oh, we have. Oh, uh, we have. Uh, let's see. Are we, uh, we, uh, we are actually rich. There we go. All right, then go to the exchange shop. Fucking get it. Oh, hello, you two are here. There it fucking is. The finale. Oh, I only needed four. Wait, what? I thought I bought five. I thought I had five. What the hell? Well, let's, I'm sure this is... Hmm. I thought I bought five! Didn't I have five? Like, I bought four and then I had... I, I thought I had one to begin with. I thought it said I, like, I had one. Didn't it say I had one? Jeez. I came to get information about yesterday's raid on Hayway, but... The shopkeeper here has never been an easy lady to work with. She seems on edge around me. Probably because I'm not a regular client. Scott and Menza went to check on Belgar Gate. They got an eyewitness report claiming the mafia had been on the premises. Why would the mafia go to a CGF post? There's actually been quite a few eyewitnesses reports leading to this. I've been hearing a ton of rumors that the CGF commanders have been hoots with the mafia. Yeah, that tracks. Yeah, word on the street is he's been bribed. Man, I never really liked that guy to begin with. Fucking equip. Seriously? Oh, for fuck's sake. Sorry, sorry to you. Let's give you something better. You don't really need to move. Go. We got it. All right, now let's go somewhere appropriate to read. All right, time to finally do it. We're gonna read back alley, Dr. Glenn.
Chapter one, the back alley doctor. Yeah, the guide said not to do that yet. Yeah, thanks, Doris. Remetheria, the principality of the beautiful north, was renowned across the Moria for its advanced medical care. Its modern, well-funded hospitals attracted skilled doctors from a multitude of countries, and its cutting-edge medical technology was developed by specialists from the finest manufacturers the principality had to offer. However, despite how brilliantly this nation's medical excellence shone, it concealed a dark side as well. Implementation of orbital technology had been put off for years in the poor downtown district. As a result, it lacked not only the quality of life, but the level of hospital care that the principality was so well known for. Deep in this quiet, rundown area, where the already chilly region's winds seemed to bite with a pronounced sting, stood only a single clinic. This 40, the 40-year-old building's age was apparent with but a glance. Its dilapidated exterior did a thorough job of extinguishing any hope finding a decent general practitioner within. On this particular day, the silhouettes of two people could be seen through its dirty cracked windows. One million Mira! shouted an older man as his eyes hysterically darted across the sea of zeros that flooded his bill. Across from him sat a large man in his mid-thirties, sporting an unkempt beard that perfectly set, accented his apathetic demeanor. You would recognize this massive muscular figure as a doctor, if not for the filthy frayed lab coat he wore. Oh, my bad. I got that number wrong, didn't I? The doctor answered in a low voice. He took the bill from the older man and quickly scribbled an extra zero on the end. Whoa! Seeing the price jump by tenfold in an instant. The old man's face changed from an anxious pale to a fury sheet of red just as quickly. Dirty swindler! These treatment scores are ridiculous! I refuse to pay for this! And indeed, it was far beyond what any legitimate doctor was legally allowed to charge for medical services in Remetheria. Watching the outraged old man sputter and curse, the doctor could not but laugh. Something tells me you've got more than enough mirrors sitting around. Not to say if any of it's clean, but I'll still accept it, kind man that I am. Oh, here we go. So he is a good guy. The patient was a corrupt politician, his infamy boosted by un unending rumors surrounding his bribery and tax evasion. He had come to this doctor that day with three bullets in his body. It was apparently by his choice of physician that the politician had landed himself in some manner of serious trouble. Trouble that would ruin his reputation if his wounds had become publicly known. At this particular doctor had extracted the bullets in secret, however, standard surgery costs had been bolstered by a few additional fees to ensure a silence. I figured that would be more than a fair price in exchange for one's life. The doctor said with a calm tone that only barely concealed the threat behind its words. However, this simply served to provoke the old man even further. In a rage, he drew a concealed orbital gun and thrust it into the doctor's back. The doctor, unperturbed, simply continued smiling. Oh, well, as your physician, I feel I should advise you. Your treatment isn't quite complete just yet. If you put a bullet in me, I certainly won't be able to take that one last one out. He turned and pointed his finger at the old man's stomach. Oh shit! Running his hand over the spot the do as the doctor indicated, the old man felt a jolt of pain. There was something hard still lodged under his skin. The doctor had intentionally left the last bullet untouched. Realizing the position he was in, the old man slowly lowered his gun. A look of pain, pla pain defeat on his face. I trust that it clears up the issue of the bill then? Flames of anger left the old man's eyes. All that remained was fear. Shortly afterward, the doctor finished the surgery. The doctor's name was Glenn. Back alley, Dr. Glenn. Despite being an exceptionally talented doctor, he was unaffiliated with any of the hospitals in the principality. Known as a back alley doctor, 
He treated everyone from politicians to illegal Ill immigrants to murderers, and demanded outrageous prices in return for his secrecy. A few days later, Glenn sat in his worn-down chair and gazed absently at the suitcase containing 10 million Mira that had been delivered to his cl clinic. Yeah, no, he's uh, he's 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 making bad guys pay. Yeah, which is good. Yeah, so he's not a bad guy. Kind of reminds me of Akiyama, uh, from Yakuza. He moved his gaze to the window and stared at the heavy drops of rain splashing against the pane. It was uncommon to get such laden raindrops in the colder northern climate of Remtheria. Surely no clients would be showing up today of all days. He thought to himself as sheets of water began pounding on his window and the din of the rain grew even louder outside. Pardon me. The sudden sound of a voice from behind him snapped Glenn out of his thoughts. He turned his head to see a nurse standing in the hallway of his dilapidated clinic. Ooh, okay, here we go. Is... is there a name... a doctor by the name of Glenn here? Oh, no, no. Is there a doctor by the name of Glenn here? The nurse asked with a smooth, dignified tone as she stood there in the entryway of the clinic. She had a youthful beauty to her. Glenn guessed that she must have been in her early twenties. Yeah, that'll be me. Glenn motioned for her to come in. She bowed, folded her umbrella, and closed the door behind her. The umbrella clearly hadn't served her well in the windy downpour outside. Raindrops trickled from her bangs, r running down her cheeks onto the fabric of her uniform, the front of which was completely sodden. Glenn carelessly threw the mirror case in the corner, grabbed a clean white towel from the nearby shelf and tossed it to the nurse. She thanked him and quickly dried her wet hair. As Glenn watched her, he noticed that her movements had a certain charm to them. Getting a better look at her face, he found himself utterly captivated for a moment. So much so that he nearly blurted out something along the lines of, Haven't we met before? He stopped himself in time, however, not wanting to utter such a painfully cliched pickup line. He cleared his throat in order to regain his, it's like a film noir type thing here. He cleared his throat in order to regain his composure, and then off to her seat. So... What do you want from me? He asked. My name is Sherry. I work as a nurse at Emeria General Hospital. A boy with an incurable disease was hospitalized just today. I request that you operate on him. Silence filled the clinic. Surprised by the lack of a response, Sherry tilted her head inquisitively. A moment later, the response came. It started as a cycle chuckle, but quickly exploded into great, booming laughter. Glenn knew about Amaria. It was one of the biggest hospitals in the Principality. Personally backed by the head of state, the Prince. It was a facility said to have brought together the best doctors far and, far and wide. The one that supported the latest medical technology and the most cutting-edge techniques. also a hospital that was protective of its image. Patients deemed incurable were outsourced so as to not reflect poorly on the hospital's track record. For a back alley doctor like Glenn, whose business relied heavily on confidentiality, this wasn't an unusual request. A lot of the high and mighty hospital administrators having to resort to asking a displaced doctor like himself for help was always a great sort of, sort of amusement to him, however. Well, to the distinguished gentleman in the end of that ivory tower of a hospital, mention you know how much it is in for me. Glenn's jovial mood subsided, and he instantly switched to a business like demeanor. If he was going to be doing their dirty work, he planned to make sure the compensation was thorough. Sherry sternly stared back before responding, 
her voice firm with determination. This, there appears to be a misunderstanding. I'm not making this request on behalf of the hospital. This is my own personal request. Boy, what? Len was taken off his guard by this admission. Averting her eyes, Sherry continued. The boy. My patient suffers from crystallization. What the hell? <coughs> Sorry. Crystallization. Glenn's eyes widened at the name. He knew it well. Further, he now understood exactly why she had come to him. The disease had great significance to Glenn, as it was not an exaggeration to say it was the sole reason he became a black back alley doctor in the first place. Take me to the patient. Let us know what I'll do after a medical examination. He said without hesitation. Sherry nodded in agreement. Yeah, what is this? Or this is freaking aripathy? Like, <laughs> what the hell? Chapter 3, The Patient. As the two of them made their way to the hospital, the rain let up, draping them in a cold human air. From a fair distance off, their destination could be seen, standing proudly against the gray sky above. It's quite the place, isn't it? Glenn mumbled, half to himself, as they arrived. The Mary General Hospital was built only last year. It was a marvelous structure, pristine and dignified. Clearly a project the prince himself would be proud of. Dr. Glenn, this way. Sherry ushered the awestruck Glenn further inside. Given that he was an outsider not employed by the hospital, it was against Demaria's policy for Glenn to examine the patient. Knowing this, he had hoped to stand out as little as possible. However, walking through the spotless gleaming halls of the bright war white ward, only served to highlight the dirt and stains covering Glenn's shabby coat and the tangled mess of hair that covered his head. Serious patients and staff alike wore down on him as he hurriedly, fo hurriedly followed Sherry. She led him through a number of corridors until they finally arrived at the pediatric ward, room number 303. Sherry knocked thrice before entering and saw a young boy of about 14 years old lay in the hospital bed. As Sherry entered, he turned to her and puffed his cheeks up in indignation. Sherry, where were you? The boy whined to apologetic Sherry. Brazen would be a perfect description of the child, but it was apparent he and Sherry were close. I'm guessing he's her little brother. Sherry introduced Glenn to the boy, whose name was Hugo. Hugo greeted Glenn with a friendly, Nice to meet you. Glenn, however, didn't respond. Instead, he swept his eyes around the room, spotting a violin leaning against the wall to remember what Sherry had told him along the way. Oh my god, it's like fucking like Amiya. He plays the violin. <laughs> Hello, Chi, welcome to the stream. Said to be a violin prodigy. 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 Hugo had already won a great number of competitions before even reaching his teens. The month prior, magazines had run features on him, praising the young musician's skill. Just when his name was beginning to soar, however, he was struck with crystallization. Glenn looked down at the boy and saw as he wore thick gloves upon both hands. Upon seeing the gloves, the grizzled doctor made a sour face. He knew patients with the disease would often use gloves to conceal their symptoms. Let's stir the medical exam. Glenn bluntly announced approaching Hugo and forcefully grabbing the boy's right wrist. What are you doing? Hugo began struggling, but he couldn't break free from Glenn's iron grip. In fact, most adults would have found it difficult to escape from the doctor's brawny arms. Sherry wordly watched over the tactless examination as Glenn removed the glove from the still struggling boy's hand. Glenn's breath caught in his throat upon seeing the gleam. There, at the end of the boy's arm, where there should have been a small tender hand, Oh no, said a cold crystalline mass, showing the familiar green color, that of an Asmellus gemstone. 
It was unmistakable. This was crystallization. He's turning into an ornament. Oh God. Is this a real disease or, or not? Like what the hell? Is this a real disease? I mean, obviously, in, not not in real life, obviously, but like in, in in like in the trails world. Jeez. Hello, Dream and Gabe. Welcome to the stream. Oh well, thank you. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm always trying to get better. Crystallization. Upon closer inspection, the crystal resembled the carving of a human hand down to the finest detail, like an exquisite work of art. But a sculptor talented and experienced enough to craft something so precisely lifelike had yet to be born. The reason was because this dazzling as Mellis crystal truly was once Hugo's hand. The effects would manifest quickly, transforming the body from beginning from the tips of one's fingers or toes. The process did not result in any pain. Parts of the body affected would remain lifelessly frozen in place. If left untreated, it would continue to spread up the limb, and after about a month, it would reach the heart, resulting in death. The disease was known as crystallization. Its cause was unknown, and the only treatment that could save the victim from a cruel death was amputating the crystallized parts of the body before it spread. Hugo could survive, but a bleak cost for an aspiring violinist like himself. Dang. Oof. Yeah, you're right. Something. Oh my God! In very recent One Piece chapters. Yeah, you're right, T. In the most recent One Piece chapters. Glenn stood transfixed, staring at the boy's hand. Memory surged through his mind like flashes of lightning. When he was still a respectable doctor, he had to try to, to, to take out this very disease. But all it brought him was. Let go of me already, you big idiot! The boy's outburst snapped Glenn back to his senses. Wriggling back and forth wildly, Hugo finally managed to wrench himself free of the doctor's mighty arm. He then launched into a verbal assault on Glenn, frustrated that a stranger had seen the state of his hand. Sherry didn't tell him that she was bringing a doctor? The doctor waited patiently for Hugo to finish. Finally, overcome with emotion, the young boy broke down in tears. Damn it! What'd you do that for? He cried as Sherry comforted him. It took a while to settle him down, and eventually he crawled back into his bed, pouting. Glenn and Sherry left the boy and stepped outside the room. For a while, the two of them stood in silence. It was Glenn who first spoke. The brat's crystallization is at an early stage. If he's operated on immediately, his life will be saved. Any surgeon at this hospital can do an amputation. He paused. What do you want from me? The quiet tone of Glenn's voice was a far cry from his earlier forcefulness. It made clear all his spirit is evap out evaporated upon seeing the boy's condition. Hugo's dream is to become a professional violinist. Sherry began. And he has more than enough talent to make it come true. For him, that dream is equal to his life. Dr. Glenn, I want you to cure his crystallization without sacrificing his hands. Sherry looked up at the doctor with pleading eyes. I want you to make the impossible possible. Jeez, oh, another Gurren Lagann reference. Doctors aren't gods, Glenn said, casting his gaze downward. Hearing his response, Sherry felt what little hope she had evaporating. She tried to find something to say to change Glenn's mind, but no words came to her. In turn, he said nothing more himself. It was neither Glenn nor Sherry that broke the pain silence between them. I wonder who it was. Oh, it's Hugo, probably. 
Oh, it's a different person. It's no use. That man can't do it. Ha! Glenn and Sherry looked up to see someone standing in the quiet corridor of the hospital. It was a slender, tall man clad in a spotless white coat. He had cast a piercing gaze at them from behind his silver rimmed glasses. Doctor! Being a nurse. Oh, Doctor! Being a nurse at a Marriott General Hospital, Sherry knew him as one of. The oh, yeah, Chapter 5 is called Rufus. That's his name. Sherry knew him as one of the doctors and worked with him daily. Glenn also happened to know this man. It had already been 10 years since they last spoke. Rufus? Glenn? What are you doing here? <laughs> Rufus scowled. Sch Sherry's lack of surprise at this exchange suggested that she was aware the two of them were acquainted. However, she could do little more than watch dejectedly as the tension rose in the air. Rufus looked at her inside, an annoyed crease forming in his brow. What made you think it was a good idea to bring some Bacchali doctor like him here? You should know that this could ha hurt the hospital's reputation. The look in Sherry's eyes switched to one of resolve. She was well aware of the consequences when she brought Glenn with her, and was not about to give up just yet. What do you mean by can't? She asked, as if challenging Rufus's words. Glenn found himself wondering why Sherry's patient with the boy in the nearby room was so important to her. However, he decided against voicing the question for the moment and stood in silence. Simple. That man abandoned his work. When it came down to it, he ran away from being a doctor. No matter how skilled he may be, someone like him is incapable of curing the incurable. He cannot stop the crystallization disorder. Glenn let out a dry, bitter laugh as though to agree with Rufus. Then, with, then, without saying anything further, he turned and began walking away. Dr. Glenn! Well, I mean, how could you expect anyone to cure an incurable disease? Like, did Glenn actually do it once? Sherry hastily followed after him. Rufus looked on as the two of them made their way down the hall. As they turned a corner, Rufus uttered a quiet hmm. before turning his attention to the nearby room. Room 303, the room he, where Hugo was staying. He cleared his throat and knocked three times on the door. Hugo, it's time for your checkup. From the rooftop of Mary General Hospital, Glenn gazed down at the city streets lined with high-end stores and well-kept houses. The view riddled with signs of the advanced oval technology the country had been integrating. Brought him no peace, however. Instead, it only made him miss the rough hewn charm of the city's declining downtown. Felt it suited him much better than such a pristine sight. Sherry stood behind him, a worried expression on her face. Doctor, I. Rufus, how good is his work? Glenn asked. Ward interrupted her and changed the subject out of any actual curiosity. Unable to get around his deflection, she had no choice to answer the sudden question. Dr. Rufus was scattered when this hospital was first founded. He saved many lives over the course of his career. In addition, he's published a great number of research papers. There were even rumors he's going to be hired as a professor, despite only being 34. <laughs> He's an ordinary man, doing good in his own ordinary way. Glenn said with a satisfied look. Even that ordinary man wants to save the boy's life! Sherry shouted. How does she know about him? Her outburst faded to a muted tone, however, as she continued. But he plans to amputate Hugo's hands. That's what'll save the boy's life, and that's what should be done. Glenn said, matter of factly. Expected this conversation to end there, as their previous exchange in the hallway had. Sherry would not accept this outcome, however. Oh! 
Here we go. Dr. Glenn, 10 years ago, you devised a surgical method to reverse the crystallization process. That's why, even if it's a risk, if there's a chance Hugo might be able to keep his hands, I want to bet on your success. Hearing that caught Glenn by surprise. Glenn chanced upon the idea years ago. A revolutionary technique able to reverse the process of the disease. To cure it without amputating crystallized parts. It really would make the impossible possible. Row, row, fight the power. Certainly, if it worked, Hugo's life and dream alike would be saved. But even so, the thought of revisiting that chapter of his past would only reopen the scar in Glenn's soul. A few moments of silence, he spoke quietly. You know that technique was a failure, right? I thought I thought something like that might have happened. Sherry cast her eyes downward in silence. She knew about the operation's outcome. And because of that, I lost her. With a somber tone, Glenn began to recount the story of his past. The incident ten years ago. Katarina. Here we go. Ten years ago, Glenn worked with Rufus at a hospital in the Principality of Remferia. The two of them, blessed with talent, were promising names among the young doctors. One day, the two visited a small theater where they saw a traditional Remetherian dance known as a ballet. The dancer on stage was incredibly talented, and both men were awestruck, instantly falling for her. Her name was Katarina Ford. The two doctors came back many times to watch her perform, and as if by fate, somehow became acquainted with the girl whose smile shone like the sun. Oh, wait, wait, is the child's sister her then? The two men even got to know her child's sister, who took a liking to them as well. It wasn't long before Glenn and Katarina fell in love. Oh, well, that's nice. Oh, but she, oh, but she dies. They were such a perfect match that even Rufus, his friend and rival in love, wholeheartedly supported the couple. However, their happy days together would be all too short. One day, Katarina came down with an incurable disease and was hospitalized at Glenn and Rufus' workplace. The disease in question was none other than crystallization. Her legs, the life of a ballerina, were immobil immobilized converted to beautiful as Mela's crystals up to her angles. Ah, it's pretty, right? She said, smiling and holding up the gemstone that was once her foot up to the light, as Katarina's way of staying strong and positive, typical of her bright personality. Glenn and Rufus, the doctors charged with their care, found it increasingly difficult to have such an outlook, however. To save her life, they both knew there was no other way than to amputate the crystallized beef. It had to be done soon. But despite everything, they couldn't bring themselves to take such a drastic measure. For Katarina's heart still burned with passion for dancing. A passion that would be cruelly snuffed out were she to go undergo an amputation. doctors desperately searched for an alternative, any possible method to save both her life and her legs. They scoured the records of all known cases of crystallization. They examined and re-examined her to try and find the real cause. Any possible leader hypothesis was followed up on as quickly as possible. One day, their frantic work finally paid off. Glenn had made a discovery. Patients with crystallization all had a common symptom, a small tumor in the heart. Oh my god. Initial studies suggested that this growth secreted a specific type of toxin that was then dispersed through the bloodstream and deposited in the extremities of the body. When it accumulated in great enough quantities, it would convert the patient's hands and feet into the familiar green crystals. If the tumor could be surgically removed, the root cause would be no more, and the condition would slowly reverse over time. As the medical world was excited over these findings, 
The two doctors in charge of Katarina did not rejoice. The removal of a tumor, tumor inside the heart. Oh, shit. Inside the heart, too. Was an extremely dangerous operation. Even in a country as renowned for top tier medical practices as Remferia was, it would be an intensely difficult surgery. If they failed, it would mean her death. But time was not on her side. Crystallization was advancing. They had to make a decision. The only option is to remove the crystallized parts. Choosing between life and ballet is foolish. Ruf Rufus asserted. Not wanting to go through with such a risky procedure, Lugan agreed with this conclusion. Even if his love would lose her ability to dance, as long as she had her life, she could find a new passion. However, Katarina disagreed. Ballet is everything to me. Losing my legs is no different than losing my life. If there is even a small chance that you can do it, I want to bet on your success. Oh, God. Oh, and he failed her. Oh, God. Oh, man. She begged her beloved Glenn. Oh my god, Gabe. Yeah, that, that, that could totally happen. Jeez. Wow. As the operation neared, Glenn grew more conflicted by the day. She was betting on his success, but with her life as the chips. The closer the surgery drew, the more he began to worry. In the end, her wishes got through to him, and he finally decided to do as she asked. Rufus was fiercely opposed, but upon seeing the look in Glenn's eyes, he understood his friend was all. Seeing that Glenn would do anything to save her, he realized there was nothing he could say or do that would stop him. The day arrived. Glenn was to be the surgeon. Katarina's sister looked on with concern as Katarina was transported to the operating room. I believe in you, Glenn. Oh, God. Oh, God. Hello, March. Welcome to the stream. Whispered Katarina. Grasping Glenn's rugged hand, she fell into a deep sleep under the anesthesia. She never woke up. Oh. She never woke up. Glenn's story was finished by Rufus as he stepped out to join Glenn and Sherry on the rooftop. Afterward? Glenn abandoned the hospital. He ran away from Katarina's death and became a good-for-nothing back-alley doctor. Upon hearing Rufus's words, Sherry glanced over at Ren. Glenn. What do you want, Rufus? Glenn didn't look up at his old friend. He simply continued staring down at the city below. Rufus took a moment to choose his words carefully before finally replying. The date for Hugo's operation has been decided. It's one week from today. <sighs> Alright, halfway point of the story, let's go. Chapter 7, The Clash. Upon hearing the news from Rufus, Sherry immediately objected. Object objected. Oh, wait! Dr. Rufus, it's too soon! Unfortunately, the symptoms, symptoms of crystallization will not wait. We need to operate as soon as we can. Rufus responded. Glenn, his back turned to them, did not show any reaction. He simply continued to gaze down at the city and silently listened, as he silently listened. We discussed this with Hugo when he consented to it. As a nurse, you aren't in his position to object. He continued. I'm guessing that the nurse is the is the little sister of Katarina. His cold statement temporarily got the better of Sherry. Without any way to dispute Rufus's words, she bit her lip in pain dismay. The worst part was she knew he was right. Hugo's 14-year-old body was not smaller than average adults. 
the time left until the crystallization reached his heart was also shorter. It was a natural, logical decision for a doctor to proceed with the surgery as soon as possible. Even so, Sherry protested. Doctor, do you think nothing of Hugo losing his hands? What I am concerned with, Rufus, Rufus replied without hesitation, is whether he loses his life. Preserving that is my top priority. He won't be able to pursue any dream if he dies. In his words, Sherry could feel the pain he felt at losing Katarina. Knowing this, she couldn't hide her sorrow. Rufus looked past Sherry to the large frame doctor, who was still looking out over the city. I will save the... Oh. I will save the child, he declared to Glenn. Good. Save me the trouble of declining. Glenn said as he turned and began to leave, his eyes avoiding Rufus's as he passed. Do your best, Dr. Rufus. He nonchalantly waved goodbye, his back turned to the others as he exited the rooftop. <laughs> Pathetic, muttered Rufus. With that over, he urged Sherry to return to work, telling her that he would let the fact that she secretly called in an unregistered doctor slide this time. Her shoulders sagged. As she listened, her eyes were fixed on the ground. She was lost in her thoughts and swirling emotions. Don't involve him. We'll only make this more difficult for him. Rufus conceded. Sherry raised her head at those words and looked into Rufus's eyes. I'm sorry, Dr. Rufus. There's one thing I forgot to tell Dr. Glenn. What? Rufus asked, confused. Sherry did not answer the question, however. She simply began hurrying after Glenn. Rufus was left alone on the roof. The wind began to pick up, causing his white coat to, coat to flutter. He rubbed his temples and let out a long, deep sigh. Chapter 8. Alright, moving past halfway. Chapter 8, Irritation. Glenn returned to his clinic downtown. Found the place just as he had left it. After walking through the pristine white halls of the hospital, however, he was all the more aware of how shabby and disorderly his tiny clinic was. He glanced over the corner where he had thrown a case full of Mira. It still sat there, nestled among dusty cobwebs. Even if the building he worked out of was 40 years old, it would surely be in better shape if he maintained it every now and then. And thanks to his confidentiality fees, it wasn't as though he lacked the Mira. He simply didn't have the energy for it. Glenn, you're a respectable doctor. Katarina would chide him. You should care more about how you look. Her words bubbled up in his mind as he slumped down his worn out chair. There was something she had said to him one more, on more than one occasion back when she was still alive. Being a ballerina, she was always conscious of her appearance, both on and off the stage. Katarina was elegant, beautiful, and bright. She was everything Glenn lacked, which is also what attracted him to her in the first place. In all likelihood, the same was true as Rufus as well. Glenn's mind darted to another familiar thought. One he had repeatedly dwelt on for the past decade. How would everything have turned out if she had chosen Rufus instead of him? After coming down with the crystallization, she was left with but two options. Give up her legs to ensure her survival, or try to save her legs by gambling with her very life. She chose the latter and begged Glenn to attempt the risky surgery. Though initially unsure, he eventually sympathized with her and attempted it. Had she been with Rufus, however, in Glenn's mind there was a chance Rufus would have chosen to go against her wishes in order to save her life. If things had turned out that way, she would have survived. Even without her legs, she would still be around. She might have even found a new passion, one as to steer to her as ballet was. Glenn knew all too well that thinking of what is was utterly useless. He 
and even so, he had spent every single day in that, in that ten years since her death, going over every detail, replaying every mistake, and theorizing every other possible outcome. Each day, sinking a little further into his regret until he was drowning, no longer able to see the surface. Today was different, though. After returning from Ameria, Glenn's heart turned like a stormy sea. Was seeing Hugo's crystallized hands the cause? Did hearing how the boy had to choose between his dreams and his life hit too close to home? Perhaps it was simply seeing from Ru from see simply seeing from Ru from simply seeing Rufus again after all these years, or maybe it was all of the above. Coming up against such a familiar situation, having to relive the same traumatic events that sent him down the path to becoming a back alley doctor. Regardless of the cause, he was irritated. Drawing short, ragged breaths, he went to his desk and opened the second drawer. After digging out the back for a moment, he dragged out an old, massive file. It bore no title, but one look at its size and sheer number of papers dumped in it was a clear sign of just how many years it took to compile. Glenn stared in silence for a moment. Suddenly, a white-hot rage bubbled up inside of him. Using the full force of his brawny arms, he threw the file with all his might. Oh god. It hit the wall with a dull thud, bursting open, scattering its contents all over the floor. The outburst did not bring, bring Glenn any peace. However, as he watched the paper flutter down before him, the only thing he felt was his battered heart breaking even further. Doctor? The sudden sound of a voice from behind him snapped Glenn, Glenn out of his thoughts. He turned his head to see someone standing in the hallway. It was the nurse from Maria General Hospital, Sherry. She looked around the room in surprise at the paper scattered across the floor. It is about the operation. It was already settled, remember? <sighs> Glenn growled at her in a low voice, glaring angrily at her. She was taken aback for a moment at the darkness in his gaze, but quickly regained her composure. I've only come here to tell you something I've forgotten to mention before, she said. Something you forgot to mention? Glenn said, his patience running thin. Glenn's furious glare would quickly transform into a bewildered expression, however, as she continued. Yep, ah, oh, that, yep. Obviously. Sherry is just my nickname, she said in a firm voice. My full name is Cheryl Ford. The woman you love, the one who lost her life to crystallization? I'm her sister. Yep, I thought so. Oh, goddamn. Yeah, nine. Chapter nine, Sherry, yep. Th yeah, that, 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 makes, that makes a lot of sense. You're... Katarina's sister. The shock at all sent Glenn reeling for a moment. Sherry remained composed, however. She looked straight at him and nodded. Looking into her eyes, it was clear that to, to Glenn that she was telling the truth. Cheryl. He remembered the name. She was Katarina's younger sister. He had seen her many times during Katarina's hospital stay. Cheryl lived with her, with her older sister on that baited day right up until she was taken into the operating room. Looking closer at Sherry, the resemblance was obvious. Oh wow, so the have we met before was not, was not like just a pickup line. They really had met before. The resemblance was obvious. She had a familiar kind of dignity and elegance in her eyes. The same grace in her movements Katarina was had. Glenn felt ashamed of failing to recognize. Yes, yeah, seriously. Was he so disconnected from those he once cared for? Dude, that makes sense. He stood there a moment, lost in his thoughts. Sherry broke the silence. Your cure for crystallization cost my sister her life. But why did she request such a risky surgery in the first place? Have you ever thought about that reason, Dr. Glenn?
It was so she could keep her legs and continue being a ballerina. Glenn responded reflexively. Sherry shook her head. It wasn't just that. The day after you discovered the idea, she told me she wanted to try it. I was against it. I'd heard it was very risky. I told her I wanted to give up ballet in order to guarantee she would live. But she didn't hesitate in her reply. Sherry closed her eyes and put a hand to her chest as she recounted her late sister's words. I want to do it. Not just for my own sake, or so that I could continue ballet. This is a terrible illness. When I was told the only way I could survive would be it involved losing my legs, I was in despair. But when Glenn told me he discovered a new surgical technique to cure it, I felt a warm light shining inside my heart. I think this is what hope is. If this method succeeds, it could bring that same hope to other patients with crystallization. I know this operation is still imperfect and comes with a high risk, but that's exactly why I want to be the first to try it. Whether it succeeds or fails, I'm sure that Glenn will learn something and be able to perfect it further. Before long, nobody will have to fear crystallization. Because one way or another, my beloved Glenn will succeed. Oh, wow. She was going to sacrifice herself as a test subject. That was her fucking plan. Oh, God. Hearing Katarina's words, Glenn couldn't shake the feeling that she was talking directly to him through her sister. <sighs> Sherry continued. I mourn the death of my sister, too. And yet, I can't help but recall how you and Dr. Rufus did everything you could to save her. The respect I had for the two of you led me to pursue nursing. So please, Doctor, don't forget your Gregor. Don't regret your choice. Her message delivered, she bowed. After a long moment of silence, she raised her head and quietly left the clinic. Glenn, still speechless, slowly and shakily lowered himself down into his chair. For what seemed like hours, he stared at the spot where Sherry had stood. The irritation he felt before he van had vanished, leaving a sudden clarity he had felt in a long time. He now finally knew what Katarina had been thinking back then. He had heard her words from ten years ago, and her sister had left him with parting words of her own. Don't regret your choice. All he had to do now was decide how to respond. The next morning, Glenn began carefully picking up the papers scattered across the floor. The regret and anger that filled his eyes the day before had been replaced by the fires of determination. Chapter 10, Hope! Alright, final five. It was the evening three days before Hugo's amputation was to take place. After the date had been decided, Rufus, the boy's doctor, had been visiting his room each day to explain a little more about the procedure. Are you listening, Hugo? Rufus asked in a tactful tone of voice. Since the surgery had been scheduled, Hugo had been absent minded and listless. The reason was clear to everyone there. He had no hope for a future without his hands. A future where he would never again play the violin. Sherry, the nurse assigned to take care for Hugo and assist Rufus, could hardly bear it. I hate this, Hugo said suddenly, gazing down at the thick gloves that covered his crystallized hands. Why me? Why am I the one that has to go through this? Sherry bit her lip and pulled back with frustration. It'll be okay, Hugo, she said. Having lost her sister to the illness, she knew just how hollow her words must have sounded to the boy. But she couldn't think of anything else to say to him. 
Dr. Rufus, however, calmly responded. I've seen many patients over the course of my career. Among them, there were some whose lives slipped away without even so much as a glimmer of hope that they might survive. In your case, however, your survival can be guaranteed. As long as you undergo the procedure, you will live on. You'll be able to find a new path in life. I think that's fortunate, don't you? His words left the boy no room to object. Hugo gritted his teeth for a moment, but seemed to deflate a bit afterward. As they're resigning himself to his fate. This is fine, Rufus, Rufus thought. As long as he lives, he will still have possibilities. He only needs to find a new passion. Not like Katarina. When she lost her life, she also lost all her potential futures. An answer like that is just like you. A baritone voice interrupted. Everyone there turned to look at the entrance of the room. There, his burly figure filling the door frame, stood the back alley doctor. Dr. Glenn! Sherry gasped, her heart filled with re relief for what looked like felt like the first time in a while. Glenn showed her a small smile. Why are you here? Rufus adjusted his glasses and shot a glare at the unkept man from behind his silver rims. Without answering, Glenn merely stared back, the look in his eyes alone repelling the question. Rufus frowned. The Glenn that stood before him now seemed worlds apart from the man he last saw on the hospital roof. Glenn looked at Hugo in the bed. A flash of discomfort briefly washed over the boy's face as he recalled the doctor's previous rough treatment. The feeling quickly faded, however, as the apathy and despair that had taken hold of Hugo's heart reasserted itself. Your name is Hugo, right? Glenn asked, looking down at the boy in the hospital bed. Tell me, are you willing to risk dying? Glenn's abrupt statement startled everyone present. Not waiting for a sp response, Glenn continued. There's a procedure that can cure your crystallization without amputating your hands. But it comes with a high risk. It's not something you can overcome just through sheer determination. The danger is real and the consequences could be fatal. You must be willing to accept that. Are you? Each word he uttered was like a weight dropped in the 14 year old's mind. The look in Glenn's eyes made it clear he was not overstating how risky this procedure was. It truly could result in Hugo's death. But if he had the resolve, if he was willing to take that risk, then everything could be over with without losing his hands, without losing his musical aspirations. Hugo, overcome with emotion, started to cry. The wishes he had buried, the feelings he had repressed for the sake of his survival, burst out from him all at once. I... I... I would die for these hands! The light of hope was shining in his heart. Alright, final four. Chapter 11, Resolve. Hugo, you should reconsider. Rufus swiftly interjected. Though he was addressing Hugo, his gaze was fixed squarely on Glenn. Rufus shot a fierce glare at his former colleague. This procedure to cure him without losing his hands. Is it the same procedure you attempted on Katarina? You should know better than anyone what a failure that was. The cold anger in Rufus's voice pierced Glenn like icy daggers. In response, Glenn held up the thick vial he was carrying. It was a result of all the research I've done in the ten years since I became a back alley doctor. He tossed the file to Rufus, who was taken off guard for a moment by its sheer weight. He began scanning through the documents. The file contained an enormous amount of research about crystallization. Clinical records, medical cases, reports of procedures and results. It was obvious some materials were illegally obtained, but they were all highly informative. 
Rufus reaches the final document in the file, his eyes widen. The document was a highly detailed description of a new surgical procedure, different from the one Rufus knew of, one that had cost Katarina her life. Ooh, so he's vastly improved it. That's good. I developed that after going through over everything that happened during Katarina's surgery back then. It's all thanks to her. Len said quietly before falling silent. It was clear he had continued fighting the crystallization disease for a long time, even after he left lawful medical practice. Years of tre treating patients as a back alley doctor, allow him to research and perfect a new procedure. Because one way or another, my beloved Glenn would succeed. Realizing her sister's words were right, Sherry began to softly cry. Hmm. It is true that by performing the procedure this way, the odds of the patient's survival should be greatly increased, said Rufus after glancing over the document. The effectiveness of Glenn's perfected technique was immediately clear to him. Hugo even perked up upon hearing Rufus' approval. However, Rufus then looked up at Glenn and the same icy glare still in his eyes. Even so? I could not hand my patient over to you. Can't they work together? Or, like, seriously. Why? Sherry stammered, bewildered. Glenn simply stood silently as Rufus continued. I've heard from Sherry how Katarina faced the danger of that surgery in order to give you more experience. To ensure that even if she did not survive, others would. She had the resolve to sacrifice her own life for that. But you... Rufus's eyes narrowed as he continued to glare. Glenn. In the face of her death, you chose to run. You fled the hospital to go wallow in an alley for a decade. Your resolve is nowhere near hers, and I refuse to entrust one of my patients to someone as weak-willed as you. Dang. Glenn closed his eyes and let Rufus's words sink in. They cut through him like finely honed blades, made all the more sharp by the fact that he knew every word was true. You're absolutely right, he said. Back then, I didn't even have the bare minimum of a resolve needed to take down this disease. As a result, I ran away and started drowning in my regrets. Glenn looked at Rufus square in the eye. But you know what? Thanks to these past ten years of wallowing in an alley, I've learned a few things. As he finished speaking, he moved his hand to his head. He felt the familiar sensation of the cold metallic object he concealed there. Holding the grip firmly, he pulled it out and pointed it directly at Rufus. Oh shit! It took Rufus a moment to re register what was going on. When his eyes finally focused on the object now hovering right before the tip of his nose, he realized he was looking down the barrier where Rhineford made Orville gun. The light from the setting sun flooded through the room's windows and cast a golden gleam on the weapon's surface. Despite the warm light, it felt as though the air in the room had suddenly froze. Are you threatening me? No, I bet he's gonna say if it's if it fails, he'll do shoot himself or something like that. Jeez. Rufus finally forced out a question to break a stunned silence. His tone was defiant, but he could do nothing to hide his trembling. Glenn smirked wryly and began to move his finger toward the trigger. Then suddenly, in one fluid motion, he flipped the gun around in his hand. The muzzle spun toward him, and the situation was reversed with it. If the patient bears a risk of dying, I think it only makes sense that I, as his doctor, should bear also bear an equal risk. Glenn said, offering the gun to Rufus. If the surgery doesn't succeed, I want you to use this to kill me. It was clear from the steely look in Glenn's eyes that he was absolutely serious. This is his unique resolve, forced from years of dealing with criminals. Resolve only a doctor of the underworld could have. 
heavy silence fell over the room as everyone there awaited Rufus' answer. He calmly closed his eyes. <coughs> his expression hidden by the sunlight reflecting off his lenses. After a moment, he reached out and grabbed the grip of the gun. <laughs> what a stupid stunt. He said, a small grip on his face. But your resolve seems to be real enough, at least. If you truly think that this procedure of yours can save Hugo, then I'll bet on your success, too. Whew! Alright. Final three. Hey. It could be for you. Chapter 12, The Operation. summoned all the doctors who would be involved in the operation, now taking place in two days, to one of the hospital's conference rooms. There, he introduced Glenn, Glenn's new surgical procedure to them, arguing it was the most effective means of dealing with crystallization. However, he received a cold response from the other doctors at first. They were not about to easily trust some unlicensed doctor running a back alley clinic. Not only were his skills called into question, but his shady reputation preceded him, making it difficult for the pair to gain any ground in the prestigious hospital. Despite this, Rufus was undeterred. He needed to lobby for their approval in performing the procedure. His ardent persuasion, combined with the impressive merits of the procedure and Glenn's thorough explanation of it, slowly won them over. And one by one, they withdrew their objections. With the hospital on board with the plan, Rufus and Glenn... All right, they are going to work together. Rufus and Glenn began going over the steps of surgery over and over. Every single day they had before, it was scheduled to take place. They wanted to do everything they could to ensure things would go as planned. For her part, Nurse Sherry continued to look out for Hugo. His mood had undergone a dramatic change the past few days. Before, when he was there, certain he would lose his hands, his eyes were dull and listless. But now they were bright and alive, yet hope. All too soon, the day of the operation arrived. Hugo's parents, whose jobs had unfortunately kept them unable to frequently visit the hospital in person, made time to come see their son into surgery. I'll see you soon, he said to them as he was wheeled in the operating room. Both he and his parents were aware that there was a chance those would be his final words. And so he gave them a brilliant smile as reassurance before he was taken away. He had no fear himself. The presence of the two excellent doctors overseeing the operation was all he needed. Here we go! Hugo was given anesthesia and finally taken into the operating room. Glenn and Rufus were sterilized and the surgical experiments that had been prepared were laid out. As the attending physician, Glenn stood before the unconscious patient. The other doctors, led by Rufus, took the cue and headed to their respective positions. For the first time in nearly a decade, Glenn had tidied himself up. He was now wearing clean, light blue surgical attire. You know, for surgery, he better, yeah. His normally scraggly hair had been tied back, and almost gave his appearance a hint of elegance. At least he would have, had it not been safely tucked into a surgical cap. Nurse Sherry was there as well, attending the operation assistant to Glenn and Rufus. She exchanged a wordless glance with Glenn and he nodded in response. At long last, the time had come. Well then, we'll start the procedure. Glenn announced. Rufus handed him a scalpel and he began. Whew! He skillfully threw the sharpened tool across the incision lines that had been marked on the boy's chest. His skin parted without resistance. As humanity evolved, so too did the human body refine itself over countless generations. Its various systems and parts came together to work as one beautiful whole, like an elegant link of orbital gears. The body is an incredible machine. Astronomically more complex than anything mankind was able to create, despite all their advances. And yet, as incredible as they are, bodies will still break down. Whether due to illness or injuries, a 
body will require repair and maintenance. It is the doctor's job to fix that which is broken and store a body to working condition. To do whatever is required to prolong the dazzling gleam of life as much as possible. No matter if it was in the spotless operating room of a prestigious hospital or the worn, grungy halls of his back alley clinic, each time Glenn performed surgery, it was a duty he felt delighted and privileged to be able to perform. He was grateful to the goddess for giving him such a talent. With that gratitude in his heart, skillful movements of the scalpel in his hand, Hugo's operation was progressing smoothly. Everyone in attendance stood in awe of Glenn's artful surgery skills as they played their own parts to perfection. Sherry wet the sweat from his brow, Rufus handed the surgical tools, and other doctors oversaw key elements such as medical equipment and anesthesia. At last, the boy's heart was exposed. Reaching this part of surgery, surgery typically took quite some time, but after watching Glenn's effortless movements, it almost seemed everyone like it had taken no time at all. Down in Hugo's chest cavity, his heart beat with a health, healthy tempo and color, healthy with the exception of the sinister dark mass that clung to the organ surface. This was the cause of everything, the tumor that resulted in the body's crystallization. This malignant growth had taken Katarina's life and countless others. A little more. Hang in there, Hugo. Sherry whispered to the sleeping boy. But as Glenn stared at the murky tumor that sat in front of him, his hand froze in place. Oh, penultimate chapter! Eleven, prayer! What's wrong? Rufus asked, noting Glenn's sudden hesitation. Oh boy. Dr. Glenn? Sherry looked up at him with concern. The other doctors looked on in confusion, not understanding what had happened. The moment Glenn caught sight of Hugo's pulsing heart, marred by that small blackened lump, his mind was pulled back to Katerina's surgery. On that day, ten years ago, everything had progressed smoothly, and by all appearances, the operation had been successful. Heart surgery is always a highly dangerous under undertaking, but Glenn, gifted with talent as he was, and succeeded in removing the crystallization tumor without incident. Everyone participating in the surgery watched as the caller returned to the heart, believing they had finally triumphed over the disease. They had been too quick to celebrate, however. The tumor had been more closely tied to surrounding tissue than expected, and removing it weakened the wall of the heart considerably. Dang! Oh, that sucks! Glenn was closing up the chest, part of the heart where the tumor once sat tore open, resulting in a large hemorrhage. Oh, that sucks. Jeez. Katarina's life flickered out shortly thereafter. You have the hidden second form of the... Yeah, this is like what it... A lot like what I imagine, um... What is that old series, Trauma, Trauma Center? Like, I, I haven't played those games, but I imagine this is what it's like. As Glenn stared at the familiar side of the tumor on Hugo's heart, his own was gripped by fear. The fear that history would repeat, that he would be responsible for another death. Glenn's body stiffened, his mind went blank, and his focus shattered and began drowning in past regrets once more. Glenn! A powerful yell from his old friend snapped him back to reality. Oops, there goes gravity. Rufus had seized Glenn's lapels and was shaking him. You should know better than this. Think of absolutely nothing else besides the operation. The only thing that matters right now is saving Hugo's life. This boy, he believes in you. Show him his trust was not misplaced. Glenn was taken aback looked at the sleeping boy's heart lay exposed on the operating table. Thump. 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 The heart pounded as if calling out to Glenn. Telling him that the boy still lived and could still be saved. It's a shame that the Trauma Center series is so touchscreen dependent because 
that's probably the only reason why I hadn't been ported to more recent systems, because it's like it was one of those games that was like fully dependent on the DS's touchscreen, like the like I guess like Switch could do it, but like I don't know. I, I guess like you could do it with a mouse and a PC release, maybe. I don't remember exactly how it went. But yeah, like any other console, like, I just, I don't think would work out. But, uh, my laptop is not a test screen voice. But I imagine mouse and keyboard could probably work. Sorry, my voice is starting to get a bit raspy from reading so much. We're almost done. Sorry, you guys. The heart pounders is calling out to Glenn, telling him that the voice still lived and could still be saved. That's right. That's right. This isn't the time to be spacing out. Glenn thought. He took a brief moment to compose himself, and once again faced Hugo, his eyes still red with, set with resolve once more. Seeing this, Rufus let go of him and signaled to the others to resume the operation. Terry saw it in relief and ready himself to continue. Rufus assumed the position opposite Glenn. It's time to perform the new technique. Segment of the operation that Glenn had refined since their last attempt. The tumor had a secret. With the exception of the central part that secreted the toxin responsible for their crystallizing effect. It was almost completely harmless. Oh! Interesting. Given time, it will be reabsorbed in the rest of the nearby heart tissue with no ill effects. So they don't have to k take out the whole thing. In other words, so long as the toxic segment was excised, there was no need to remove the rest. A small change to the procedure would have made all the difference in Kateri's surgery. When Glenn discovered this during his research, pangs of regret dug deeply into his chest. However, Katarina and Sherry's words had turned his regrets into gratitude. This refined technique existed. It could be used to save so many lives, all thanks to Katarina's sacrifice. A small smile crossed his lips as he briefly reflected on all of this. Heart and lung machine was connected, and drugs were administered to the temporary, temporarily halt Hugo's heart. Both were cutting-edge medical technology that Rufus had made special orders to obtain for this operation. With the heart lying still, Glenn carefully adjusted it to have a closer look at the tumor. Removing only the central part will require several extremely precise cuts. Wrong one move and the walls of the heart will be injured. But if successful, they could safely extract the toxins while avoiding a repeat of Katarina's complications. Sherry folded her hands. Katarina, please lend Glenn your strength. She whispered in prayer. Glenn slowly lowered his scalpel down toward the darkened tumor. Sherry, Rufus, and the other doctors closely watched the sharpened tip, each of them holding their breath. Outside the room, Hugo's parents fraught with worry, and fervently prayed to the goddess for their son's survival. They had dutifully waited since surgery began for what felt like an agonizing long amount of time, and they were nearly at their wit's end. Just as they thought they couldn't take any more, the operating light turned off. Their eyes snapped to the door, anxious for answers. Was everything okay? Would their son live? The door opened and Glenn's large silhouette filled its frame. Hugo's parents rushed toward him, their desperate hope plain on their worried faces. Woo! <laughs> Yay! Glenn looked at the two of them and slowly removed his surgical mask. Behind his face was covered in a wide grin. I'm right! Happy ending! Finale Glenn! All right! I am so glad this is not like a fucking ha a freaking despair ending. A month later, in a private room at a Marriott General Hospital's children's ward, the sound of a violin drifted out from Hugo's room. Both his hands has reverted to their tender softness, and their natural hue had been restored. No trace of the unnatural green luster remained. 
However, since Ishin had not quite yet returned to Yuga's fingertips, making the task of deftly wielding a violin bow difficult for even one of Hugo's nat one of Hugo's natural talent. Despite this, he simply could not wait any longer to return to his beloved music after being deprived of it for, for so long. His parents were visiting that day and tried to play an advanced song as usual level for them. But the only sounds the violin gave off were a series of shrill screeches. Shrill screeches. <laughs> Reminds me of my, uh, when I was in elementary school, I was in band, and, uh, we had three, <laughs> three students who did the violin. And, <coughs> and, uh, Everyone in the in the audience and the parents had uh, the pleasure to listen to Ode to Joy being played by three elementary school students playing violin. And it sounded pretty much exactly like that in stereo. Oh my god. I played clarinet, by the way. But, and I, st I stopped after junior high. His parents forced smiles on their faces and encouraged him, but Hugo didn't seem to mind one bit. A genius such as myself needs to try some avant-garde pieces every once in a while, he said with a cheeky grin, causing his parents to laugh. He could play violin once again. That was more than enough for him. They couldn't help but be ecstatic for that fact alone. He continued to play a strange experimental piece the three of them laughed together. The sounds of the small concert drifted up to Glenn as he stood on the rooftop and looked down at the city once more. He had been stopping by the hospital every so often to observe Hugo's post-operational recovery. After finishing his regular medical examination, he had taken a liking to going up to the rooftop. lean on the railing, gaze down on the city streets, and feel the breeze on his face. The sights from the roof seemed different to him now. The sights and sound was a little more warm and inviting. He still preferred the familiarity of the dingy streets he'd become accustomed to. But this part of the city was nice in its own way. On this particular day, Rufus and Sherry had joined him on the roof. Glenn, are you listening? Rufus questioned him. He and several others at the hospital have spent the last month trying to recruit Glenn. Don't you think it would be best for everyone if you worked here? There have been an especially strong push to hire Glenn for the medical specialists that had seen his surgical skills firsthand. They considered it a regrettable waste for a man of his obvious skill to live in obscurity in the downtown district. You invented an entirely new surgical procedure to reverse crystallization. Rufus has told him as they gaze down at the city streets. You could make a name for yourself here, as a respectable, resp respectable doctor. However, just like every time prior, Glenn's answer was a stubborn no. There are many people that come to my clinic downtown. He explained. They depend on me, and I don't intend to leave them now. It might just be some back alley doctor. Oh, sorry. I might just be some back alley doctor, but I'm their back alley doctor, you know? Wink. <laughs> back alley doctor Glenn. Glenn said with a grin. I see. A pity then. Rufus replied, a small smile flick flick flickering across his face. Sherry took your watch and let a small gasp. Ah, uh, doctor. Is it almost time for your rounds? Rufus nodded and turned to leave to look back at Glenn before he left. Then continue living as a back alley doctor, he said. Just be sure you can proudly tell Katarina when you next see her that the path you chose was one you don't regret. With this, Rufus left. Such a harsh step of encouragement from his old friend brought an annoyed smirk to Glenn's face. I don't need you to tell me that, he muttered. Glenn and Sherry were left alone on the rooftop. There was an awkward silence between the two, made all the more apparent by the occasional screeches of Hugo's violin drifting out of his window. 
asylum continued until Glenn, unable to bear it any further, wordlessly turned and began heading to the exit. Before he could make his escape, however, Sherry let out a soft, um, stopped him in his tracks. Dr. Glenn, I just want to thank you so much for saying, for everything that you've done, she said. I feel like I finally understand why my sister chose you. After a decade of being repaid with a gun to his back, hearing such a formal heartfelt thanks coming from the same direction, threw Glenn off for a bit. There's no need for that. He responded. His voice was softer, more sincere than normal. Oh. There's no need for that. Because of you, I was able to understand what happened with Katarina. So, I guess I'm the one who should be thanking you. Sherry was surprised by the sudden shift in attitude compared to Glenn's normal ride deflections. Now that I think about it, she said, they told me you didn't take payment for the surgery, Doctor. In recognition of his miraculous surgery, hospital had offered him, offered him payment of Mira. So there were laws that restricted the amount they could give him. It's an incredible sum Mira to the average person. Lana turned it down, however, telling him to spend it on Hugo's post off expenses. Well... <coughs> oh god, my voice is almost shot. Two more pages. Well, I don't want to accept their chump change. Said Glenn, who quickly returned to his usual demeanor. But I guess... One step Brad's willing to get on stage again. I'll have him send me free tickets to all his concerts. Thought of the infamous back alley Dr. Glenn attending a fancy violin concert brought a smile to Sherry's face. Doctor, do you remember when I first visited you? Sherry asked. I said this wasn't a job from the hospital. It was a personal request. So if you aren't interested in the hospital's payment, her voice lowered to a soft purr, perhaps I could pay you, personally. What? <laughs> Suddenly flustered, Glenn turned around, only to find Sherry standing there giggling, a mischievous smile on her face. <laughs> ah, you're just, you're just playing around with it. Glenn, beat red and entirely mi miffed at being the victim of such a prank, turned and quickly retreated from the hospital. She's just playing a joke. Sherry now alone on the rooftop, leaned down on the railing where Glenn had been. She looked up at the sky cheerfully. He's a wonderful person, Katarina, she whispered. As a soft breeze fluttered by and a few harmonious notes from violin drifted up to her ears. She almost felt like she could hear her sister laughing. The end. Ah, uh, well, that was a sweet story. That was that was like a little like a feel good story. Ah, uh, all right, you guys. Uh, next time we will continue with the uh, the final few side quests. Uh, in in this game, god damn, wow. And then it's all main story with maybe some final go rounds in chapter five, although I think chapter five is mainly just like the final dungeon or whatever, I'm not sure exactly. But until next time, I will say so long, farewell, I'll be the same good night. You're all the sweetest of hearts. See ya. <laughs>